and welcome to Entipedia. Today we will discuss the exciting world of one-way functions and their use in cryptography. Join us. Hello Bob, I don't know if you have released, but usually cryptographic algorithms are based on processes that are easy to calculate in one direction but difficult to invert without a trapdoor. Excuse me, Alice, but I'm not quite sure what you mean. Imagine, for example, this situation in symmetric cryptography. The sender can generate a cipher text from a plain text, because they know the ciphering key, but the attacker can't invert the process and recover the plain text or the key from the cipher text. Oh, I remember, if I'm not mistaken, an attacker shouldn't be able to infer the key, even if they have many pairs of the plain text and the cipher text. Technically speaking, it isn't impossible to invert the ciphering process and find the key, but in practice, its computational cost would be too high. Alice, could you please give me an example of another cryptographic function that is easy to compute one way but very costly to invert? Of course, an excellent example of this is public key cryptography, where two keys are generated, a public and a private one. Given the public key, it is too complex to calculate the private key without any additional information or a trapdoor. The same thing occurs with digital certificates. It is very easy to verify a signature, but it is computationally complex to falsify it without knowing the private key of the signatory. The paradigm of easy to compute hard to invert is very common in cryptography and the functions that have this property are called one-way functions or trapdoor functions. How interesting! So, a one-way function is a mathematical function that has an easy and quick method to compute it in one direction, but no easy way of computing it in the opposite direction, right? That's a great definition. There are many examples of one-way functions. A famous example is the factoring problem. Multiplying two prime numbers with hundreds or thousands of bits is easy for computers, but there isn't a known algorithm capable of inverting that operation, that is, to obtain the two original prime numbers from the composite number. Isn't that the one-way function used by the RSA crypto system? Yes, we will cover RSA and other one-way functions, like the discrete logarithm, in future lessons. One-way functions are a very important matter in theoretical computer science, and are very practical in cryptography. Currently, there is no mathematical proof of the existence of one-way functions, but we speculate that such functions exist, and we use some of them to build cryptographic algorithms. Wow, this is interesting. Could you give me examples of one-way functions with real use? Sure, Bob, there are plenty. One of my favorite is key protection. When you send your key to a remote computer, like your bank, for example, how does your bank verify the key? Well, I suppose the bank has a copy of my key stored somewhere. Well, that's one way of doing it. But there are more secure options. The bank doesn't store a plain text copy of your key. Instead, it stores the result of applying a one-way function to your key. This result is called the hash value. Then, when the user sends his key, the bank applies the function to the received data and compares it with the stored hash value. Can you see why this is better? I think so. This way, if someone gains access to the bank's data, they would only find the hash value, which is hard to invert. That's very clever. I would like to know more about hash functions. Don't worry. We will take a look at them now. Bob, imagine that a friend of yours wants to send you a big file over the internet, but it's too big to send it through email. Instead, he uploads the file to a public website. But, of course, you'll agree with me that someone could access the file and change it without you knowing. That's easy to solve. I'd ask my friend to sign it with his private key, and then I would use his public key to verify it's his. Right, we saw that in lesson 3. But there are even easier options we can use. For example, your friend could apply a hash function 
to the file he wants to send and obtain a value of 20 alphanumeric characters, which is called the message digest. Then your friend would send you that digest via email or phone. With that value, you would only have to make sure that the message digest you get from the downloaded file is the same your friend gave you. This way we only have to verify the integrity of several hundred bits instead of millions of bits. In fact, this method is used sometimes to distribute long public keys, software updates, etc. So if someone wants to replace my friend's file with another one without being noticed they would need to find a file whose digest is the same as the original file's digest, but since that function used to make the digest only works in one direction, it would be impossible to make that second file. Is that right? Certainly, Bob, you've nailed it. In cryptography, these types of one-way functions that generate digests are called hash functions. You could say that these functions convert a large amount of bits into a reduced amount of bits that form the hash value, usually of 128 or 160 bits. Since the result is small and the input can be very big, many different inputs can produce the same hash value. In cryptography, these inputs that produce the same hash values are called pre-images. A good hash function should be able to resist pre-images, that is, it should be computationally impossible for an attacker to find out the different inputs that produce the same output. That's a good idea. Yes, but not only that. They should also be resistant to second pre-image attacks, meaning that it should be computationally impossible to find from one message another one, that is the result of modifying the first and both have the same hash values. So, if a hash function is resistant to a second pre-image attack, that means that the one-way function will continue being one-way, even if we know that a specific message results in a specific hash value. That is exactly what we need in the security measure I mentioned earlier, when your friend was sending a file through a public website. Another important issue is collision resistance, which we will see now. Alice, it looks like hash functions are a great example of the practical usefulness of one-way functions. That's right. For example, the idea of generating digests from files is very useful in cryptography to sign files or messages, thus assuring the authorship of the content. In practice and to gain efficiency, instead of applying the digital signature to an entire message, it is applied only to the hash value. Since an attacker won't be able to find different messages that result in the same hash value, then signing the hash value is as good as signing the complete document. Now I see why hash functions have to be resistant to pre-image and second pre-image attacks, that way. Documents of different sizes can be signed. Yes, that is one of its uses. However, even when the function is resistant to second pre-image attacks, there is another possible attack. Imagine you hire a friend for a job and you both sign a document where it says you will pay them 5,000 euros. Mysteriously, the following month your friend comes back with the signed contract and it says that you will pay them 50,000 euros for that same job. The question is, how can this be possible? Well, I don't know. It would only be possible if the original contract and the modified one have the same hash value. But, didn't we see that an attacker wouldn't be able to do that if the hash function had the proper security measures? Bob, imagine that your friend generated two contracts before you signed them and that both result in the same hash value. We have to make it impossible to compute two messages that result in the same hash value, that is, collision using the same hash function. Therefore, hash functions should be collision resistant. This is a basic cryptographic property in many applications, like in the creation of digital signature schemes. Well, Alice, with what you have explained, now I am wondering how mathematicians and cryptographers manage to build these one-way functions? That is a very interesting question and, like many good questions, it isn't very easy to answer. Actually, much of the knowledge on building cryptographic algorithms, specifically block cipher algorithms, is used. The objective is for inputs with a very similar bit structure to produce completely different outputs. 
that have no correlation whatsoever. For example, in blocks ciphers of n rounds, by modifying only one bit, 50% of the output bits can change after applying the algorithm. However, there is a big difference between one-way hash functions and ciphering functions. The purpose of the former is to protect a secret or confidential message. Also, hash functions don't usually require the use of secret keys. This is one of the features that make it so difficult to design them. Nevertheless, they do share the same philosophy of making current algorithms public and attackers will use this to try to break them. Well, it looks like building a secure hash function isn't that. In fact, the design of hash functions has undergone renovation thanks to the attack suggestions of cryptanalysts. For example, standard hash function algorithms developed and used since the 90s like MD5 or SHA-1 are now either broken or under serious threat. What do you mean by broken? Well, basically, when two messages result in the same hash value, that means that the hash function isn't collision resistant. That happened to the MD5 algorithm in 2004. This is even worse when methods that produce many of these collisions are discovered. So did this discovery have any serious implications? Yes, since one of the important uses of hash functions is the digital signature, it would be easier to falsify the digital signatures when we can create collisions. So, if two different messages have the same hash value, they have the same signature, so an attacker could replace one message with the other. An example of this attack was presented in 2008 by a group of researchers in Amsterdam, who forged a root certificate using a collision attack against the MD5 algorithm. A root certificate was forged, does that mean that they could use it in any website? Indeed, digital certificates work as identification cards for websites and this attack allowed the forgery of many of these certificates. All of this because MD5 was proven non-collision resistant. That's right. You can see that this is a very serious matter. What can we do to protect ourselves from these types of attacks? Don't worry Bob, there are several lines of defense. Administrative measures allow certification authorities to hinder these attacks. For example, introducing random serial numbers to the digital certificates makes the attacks less easy. Furthermore, using secure hash functions like the ones in the SHA-2 family is, currently, without any doubt, the best solution, although this requires more computing time. Meanwhile, cryptographers are announcing new hash functions through an international competition that will bring us a new international standard, similar to what happened over 10 years ago when the Decimetric Cipher standard was changed to AES. Other ways of improving security, specifically in digital signatures, is to work on processes that don't depend on collision resistance. For example, using random variables in the process of generating the digest can produce digital signature schemes that don't depend on collision resistance. It's nice to know that cryptographers don't seem to get bored. They've always got work to do. And I don't think they get enough sleep. Well, I think that's more than enough for today's lesson. On the Antipedia website there are additional documents for this lesson. See you later. Goodbye.